Uh, so, uh, so my lab, uh, we study immunodeficiency diseases to understand the immune system. And just to show you Karolinsky Institute right now, it looks like this. So it really changed the skyline of Stockholm. So we're building a lot of new buildings. And we don't really know where the funds to it should come from yet. And I'm not ironic at all here. But when we finish, this is the new aula. And it's interesting in Sweden that uh, this is a private uh, donation. So we have a lot of funding to research comes from private donations, actually. So they gave us this aula, and it's next to the oldest building at the campus. So I love this picture. Uh, so we, uh, so as you all know, the immune system needs to be at balance uh, to combat any pathogens we are exposed to and to remain tolerant to things we should not react to. And when the immune system is at imbalance, we see development of common diseases such as allergy, autoimmunity, and cancer. And these diseases are also common in children that are born, they have inborn errors, so they lack a specific part of the immune system due to genetic mutation. And here is a boy with risk of early syndrome that both Federica and I have studied for, for a long time, actually. And you can see that this baby boy is covered with this eczema-like uh, uh, skin pathology. And they come to the clinic during the first year of life with, with often recurrent severe infections. So primary immunodeficiency raises a conundrum in immunology. How can an immune system fail to respond to non-self pathogens and still react vigorously to autoantigens and allergens? And we are many research groups that are working to, to understand this conundrum using both patient samples and mouse models. And my group, as Federica mentioned, has focused on diseases, immunodeficiencies that are caused by mutations in the cell cytoskeleton. And why is that important for immune cells? Well, as you know, the immune cells are never at rest. They constantly survey the body for intruding pathogens. They go out through the tissues. They will kill whatever is there. They will communicate with other cells and go back and so forth. And to do this, to be so dynamic, they need to have rapid reorganization of their acting cytoskeleton. This is a cell in the circulation, this is a cell moving forward, and here we have communication to cells via the immunological synapse, which is, among other things, rich in, in polarized acting. Uh, and the boss family is really important in uh, organizing the acting cytoskeleton in immune cells. So this is a dendritic cell that is moving in this direction, and you can see that the F-actin is in orange and green. It has a leading edge lamellopodia. It needs to provide some force on the substratum to move forward, and it does so by making adhesion points. These are focal adhesion type structures. They're called podosomes, these ring structures. Um, and uh, here you see two cells communicating with each other, and the reason the image is a bit blurry, this is a tumor cell and an NK cell, a natural killer cell. So here we have used image stream, which combines flow cytometry together with imaging, and you don't reach the same resol resolution as with confocal microscopy, but it's quite good anyway. So this NK cell, has made an immunological synapse, rich in effectin, and it has polarized granules with different enzymes that will be released into the tumor cell and kill it. And then uh, a large interest comes from uh, pathogens, and we know a lot about the, sort of the proteins that regulate the act inside the skeleton from studying pathogens. Because what many pathogens do, and it's Shigella, Salmonella, EPEC, EHEC, Vaccinia, they, they encode some of the actin polymerasing factors, but they also use the host um, cell cytoskeleton. So here you see Vaccinia in red dots, and they have these characteristic green actin tails that if you would look at live cell, these would move around. And they use that to infect the cell, this is a macrophage, and also to infect the neighboring cell. 
And in eukaryotic cells, there are two big families of proteins that can polymerize actin. Uh, and as you see, the spontaneous actin mediation is extremely slow and inefficient. So to go from monomeric actin into a filament occurs, but with really slow kinetics. So these actin-promoting uh, factors, they speed up the process of formings. They, are, they can nucleate actin monomer themselves and form a filament, whereas the VOSP family of proteins, they bind to the RF23 complex, or they regulate the activity of the RF23 complex, that bind to existing actin filaments and branch them. And this leads to a very dynamic actin cytoskeleton. And the was family of uh, actin regulators uh, all contain a homologous C terminal, the VCA domain for verproline coffelin acidic. And WASP was the first identified member, and this was a large effort to try to understand what goes wrong in boys with a very severe immunodeficiency. And this was the boy I showed you before with this Crohn syndrome. So already in 1937, uh, Viscott, and later in 54, 1954, Aldrich, defined that uh, uh, there were families where only boys were affected and they got a really severe disease. And then it was a large effort to clone the gene, and in 1994, this was by positional cloning at that time, there was no heat sequencing, uh, they identified the gene encoding this Crohn's syndrome, and by finding this, they could use the VCA domain and also identify the other members, N, was Wave, and last 7 p b one p that we heard more about this, this morning. And they, they, they share the C terminus, but they have different N terminal regions. Uh, so, if we look at upstream signaling, uh, so VASP is uniquely expressed in hematopathic cells, whereas the other members are more ubiquitously expressed. And they are regulated by the small family of raw GTPases, CTC42, RAC1, RAC2. Upstream of there are the guanine exchange factors that activate the raw GTPases. And upstream of that, we have a lot of different receptor signaling that we are still trying to. to uh, uh, elucidate. Uh, so then in all hematopathic cells, WASP resides as an inactive conformation due to an intramolecular interaction uh, in the protein. Upon receptor activation, CDC42 binds to the base binding domain and this allows the protein to open up to change its conformational uh, structure. This exposes the VCA domain and it induces actin polymerization. Viscarolis syndrome, as I mentioned, is caused by loss of function mutations in the protein and they have all the features of a severe immunodeficiency. And uh, this is also one of the diseases where we are currently testing a clinical gene therapy. And uh, in not recently any longer, but in 2001, it's not recent, right? Any longer, just a long time ago. Uh, there was a new family described uh, that got the name X-linked neutropenia. And these patients, it's a large pedigree, I will show you later, with six affected males, and it's X-linked, so therefore only men are affected. Uh, they had normal expression of WASP, but they could, with genetic linkage analysis, show that they have a point mutation in the DTPase binding domain, and it's an isoleucine to threonine and the um, leucine to proline, serine to proline. There's actually a new mutation right now that we found in a Chinese cohort. All these mutations have potential to destroy the folding of the protein, especially the proline, whenever you see stats, that will lead to an open up of a structure, any three dimensional structure. And the main clinical feature of these patients is neutropenia. However, we reasoned that, you know, based on that WASP is expressed in all immune cells, and loss of WASP gives really severe immune deficiency, we thought that maybe this mutation will affect all immune cells. Uh, so just to give you some, uh, some uh, sort of visual evidence for how this looks like. So this is a healthy controlled lymphocyte isolated from peripheral blood. 
it is covered with these microvilli. On the microvilli, the, the cell express different chemokine receptor, adhesion receptors, and so forth. And this allows it to adhere to the endothelial walls in the blood flow and get into tissues. So Visparoli syndrome lymphocytes looks quite different. So they have, the, they have some sort of structure, but, but they have this blebbing of the membrane and not very organized. And then if we look at the other side of the spectra, this is again a control healthy donor lymphocyte. When WASP is overactive in an X-linked neutropenia patient, you can see that this surface structure is much more dense with different protrusions. And we and others have shown that these cells have about a two-fold increase in polymerized acting. Uh, so we were interested to understand this disease. Um, uh, and we reasoned that the good way to do this is to generate mouse models. I will also show you some patient data. And the first question we asked was really, why do these patients develop neutropenia? So we were new in the neutrophil uh, field, uh, so we uh, started to think what is going on with neutrophils. And if you compare it to other hematopathic cells, they are extremely short-lived. They are all the time produced from the bone marrow. They flush through the blood. Once we have an infection, for example, in the skin, uh, the endothelium in the blood vessel will become activated and express some chemokines. This will alert the neutrophils that will start to express selectins, and then they will start to roll on the endothelium, and then the selectin will actually activate integrins that are in a closed conformation and open up. This will allow them to adhere quite firmly to the endothelial wall, allows them to spread out actually, and then finally squeeze through either between the endothelial cells or actually through the endothelial cells. Once out in the tissue, they are very efficient at releasing uh, reactive oxygen species, different enzymes that will kill the pathogens, and they could also phagocytose bacteria efficiently and kill them. So we wrote the review mostly for us, just to see you know, what kind of conditions have neutrophil deficiencies, and it's a lot of them. And they affect the all steps of neutrophil uh, life cycle, and perhaps the most um, uh, familiar one is leukocyte adhesion deficiency, uh, when neutrophils cannot adhere to the to integrin ligands. Uh, and we try to predict where our, our uh, mutation could be, and we thought it could be at all of these steps, because neutrophils are so dependent on the actin cytoskeleton. I should also say that the most common mutation in severe congenital neutropenia is mutation in elaine that encodes the neutrophil elastase. So one of these proteases that, um, uh, that can sort of kill bacteria. Uh, so Marjan Kesse joined the lab and he has, uh, this has been his main project and he's really, he has become the neutrophil expert in the lab um, and really done a lot of good work. Uh, so we asked two questions, so why do these patients develop congenital neutropenia? And then we also wanted to understand how do mutations in WASP elicit different clinical phenotypes? Here it may be overactive, here it's sort of lacking. So this was the original family described in 2001. There's uh, six affected males here. The females, the mothers, are carrier of the mutation, but since it's X-linked, they are actually asymptomatic. They have one healthy X chromosome. Um, and there have been two cases of myeloid dysplasia, one that led to the death of one of the, the grandfathers. So we actually were lucky to get these, I should say, these, um, these uh, patients are quite uncommon. So we have around 30, 40 worldwide today. It's a very uncommon disease. Um, so therefore, to get samples from this, uh, this branch of the family, three postdocs actually drove down to Belgium here. So Peter van der Berge, who, provide, who actually cares from the families in the last 20 years or something when they discovered a very nice collaboration with Peter. 
And the reason we went all the way is that neutrophils, you have to study within <coughs> one and a half, two hours after sampling. Also the B cells that Ning is really interested in, uh, you have to study quite quickly. So what did we find? Well, not so surprising. Uh, so what we got was we got samples from these two brothers, the um, sister without the mutation and the carrier mother. Uh, and there were two healthy age match controls here. So if we look at the granulocyte gate here, healthy controls or in the sister or mother, it looks fairly normal. But you can see that the two patients have really low uh, granulocyte counts. And if you see the 16, CD15, we could also define the neutrophils that are basically gone from these patients. They are not entirely gone, of course. So we did try to purify them, and when we looked by EM, we could see that control uh, blood neutrophils, they have these dense granules that they are supposed to have here and here. The two XLM uh, patients had neutrophils that looked like they were already activated, so they had released all the granule contents. Uh, and then when we actually we purified neutrophils as we normally do, uh, but what we could see, and we could see, sorry, in control cell sister and, uh, sorry, mother, we found a, a lot of the neutrophils with this characteristic nuclei. The two XLM patients were heavily contaminated with eosinophils, as you can see, that had this, have this bilobular shaped nucleus, um, which prevented us from doing any functional assays because eosinophils do a lot similar to neutrophils. But perhaps what was more interesting is that we saw cells, these are band cells, metamyelocytes, and other cells that are supposed to be in the bone marrow. So these patients seem to have some of the uh, promyelocytes that leak out into the blood. And then we talked a lot to Peter here, and it turns out that despite these really, really low neutrophil counts that these brothers have in the whole family, they have a very mild clinical phenotype. So they seldom come to the clinic. They are not dependent on GCSF, which is normally given to severe congenital neutropenia patients. They don't have that many large bacterial infections. So this made us think, is could we get some samples from a peripheral tissue to see if we find neutrophils there? And uh, could you think what we got from them? which is non-invasive. Anyone? Saliva. Right, but that was not easy to study, so uh, we finally managed to get some data from it. Um, so we got saliva from the patients again, uh, from two controls and from the mother. And again, we used this method with image stream and that was really helpful. So here you can see that we have gated for uh, the hematopoietic cell, CD45, and then CD15 as a neutrophil marker. If we look at the high cells, and then also look at sort of dysregulated cells based on the nuclear staining, we think we are seeing neutrophils. I hope you are convinced too. We have EM as well. Um, so really based on the nucleus was our strongest evidence for that these are, these are neutrophils. Now, if we then counted the cells in the saliva, it turns out that the two XLM patients have about normal numbers of neutrophils in the saliva. So it really suggests that they may have neutrophils in their tissues, although we don't find it in blood. But to really understand this, we went to the mouse models um, and we really understand you know, the underlying mechanism. So, I should say that I started this already in Boston, and now we are studying the mice. And you can do the maths, and you see how long time it took. But all we wanted to do was to add or change one nucleotide, so an ACT, uh, to, sorry, here, ATT to a TAA. Uh, sorry, here, this is one, ACT to TGA. Uh, not at all, ATT to ACT, now I am slow. It's a T to a C to make an isolucin to three, I mean, in VOS. Exon 9. The other mutation is a TT to a CC in VOSP exon 9. They are very close to each other, these mutations. Now, do you think the mice are neutropenic after all this work? Of course not. Not at all. 
So these are the neutrophil counts in the blood, wild type and the two XLM mutants. And I should say that the homology in this region, 100 amino acids spanning the mutation, is 100% conserved in amino acid sequence. Uh, so wasp, human, and mouse are extremely homologous. Uh, still no neutropenia. You know, we don't want to make an excuse here, but our wild-type mites are in a very clean facility, and this is supposedly very low counts for wild-type mice. So when we talk to neutrophil people, they want us to take them out in the lab, which is not allowed in Sweden. So it may be that also the wild-type mice are neutropenic. However, we carried on to see what we find, and there are some predictions from WASP in an open confirmation. That is, that it will be cleaved more easily if you add sort of a proteases to the protein. Another one is that the open confirmation would expose a very critical tyrosine. So when WASP is tyrosine phosphorylated, it will prolong the activity. And another one is, of course, increased polymerase active. So we looked at degradation. So here you see a wild-type wasp in neutrophils. When we lysed the neutrophils, as we normally do for BNT cells, we didn't see wasp at all. Uh, there were two proteolytic fragments here that I don't show you. So we were actually first thinking that did we make another wasp knockout, which we didn't need, actually. But then we realized that neutrophils have so much proteases in them. So we have to add really brute force um, protease inhibitors, and then we actually see the protein. Uh, and we think this is NWAS, by the way, based on the discussion this morning. Um, and the same for the other mutation. This is wild type WASP in the neutrophils, nothing in the WASP knockout, and uh, very little if we don't add the DPF in the, in the mutant XLM. But we think this is an in vitro phenomenon, so the protein is there, it's just very prone to degradation. And when we look for a phosphorylated wasp, so here we have a, a IP wasp, so we have the immune precipitation for lab wasp, wasp knockout, nothing, which is good, wild type and the two XLM mutants. When we looked for, with an antibody that specifically recognizes phosphotyrosine, <coughs> we could see that the two mutants had extremely high basal level of phosphorylated wasp, whereas we didn't see this in the wild-type neutrophils. So this suggests that this tyrosine is exposed all the time. And then we looked at actin, and I think maybe it's best to look here. Uh, so we did uh, some imaging where we looked at the cortical actin and the total actin, this one plus this one. Uh, and we used a side-by-side -side comparison because it's difficult to quantify actin. Uh, but what we could find is this is wild-type neutrophils and the XLM. So they had increased cytoplasmic actin and also increased cortical actin. And this is just a fact to show that we have increased uh, phenoidin staining of actin in the XLM uh, neutrophils compared to the wild-type and the wasp knockout neutrophils has lower. Okay, so then we went to, as you see, the bone marrow development was fairly normal in these mice. We didn't find anything. So we went to these processes where the neutrophils start to do what they're supposed to do, that is really to interact with endothelium and go through the tissues. Uh, so one thing that we also looked at with the stream, and this is life act uh, that, that binds to polymerase acting, and we can use this to look at the neutrophils in real time. And we basically look for these uh, round neutrophils, and then we add FMLP, and they start to polarize. Uh, and then we could see that compared to the wild type here, that polarize, this is present the regular cell shape. They, pol they um, change their cell shape. The two XLM uh, mutants had more rapid uh, change in cell shape, so they become more irregular cell shape. Uh, we also looked at EM for these, you know, dense surface, and you know there was some evidence for that they had a more dense uh, surface architecture compared to the wild types. Uh, so one important molecule during this process is the integrin, the CD11B integrin. So we looked for that. 
And uh, what we could find is this in naive mice, and this is looking at the beta 2 integrin expression on the neutrophils, is that the XLN neutrophils actually had lower uh, beta 2 integrin. Uh, and this was the case in the blood and in the peritoneum upon E. coli infection. Uh, so it seemed that they have lower expression of the integrin molecule that is needed to, to adhere to the endothelium. Uh, this was showing the same thing. So these are now patient data. So we went back and looked in the patients. And at the, the unstimulated state, these are the two healthy controls. These dotted lines are the two patients. If we look at CD11B expression from the beginning, one patient had lower CD11B, the other one not. But when we stimulated them, healthy donor neutrophils, they do increase CD11B expression as expected, whereas the two patients did not at all. And as you see, that neutrophils are sort of packed with a lot of molecules inside. So they are exposed on the surface as the signaling starts, and CD11B is one of those that are exposed on the surface when they are in contact with the endothelial wall. So what I showed you so far, I didn't show you the data from the, the wasp deficient neutrophils, but what we find is that uh, neutrophils with overactive wasp have a very dynamic polymerized actin, a dense surface structure, they have reduced C11B expression, and I didn't show you this, but they have reduced static adhesion on the surface area. So we thought, is this all due to that they have such an increased load of polymerized actin under the plasma membrane? And for example, vesicles with CD11B will not get out. And on the other side of the coin is the wasp deficient neutrophils. So we asked our other neutrophil functions, such as migration, phagocytosis, defective. And just to show you how neutrophils, how fast they migrate when they are in contact uh, with the ligands for integrins. So here we see the here you see the actin cytoskeleton dynamic in lifetime, and you can see that it's quite dynamic how they uh, all the time change the actin cytoskeleton. And we had some evidence for that the adhesion mark of the excellent neutrophils were different from the wild type neutrophils. But it's quite fantastic when you see them, actually. They're extremely fast. And this is from bone marrow in mouse, I should say. Uh, so we had some sort of initial findings that were difficult to understand, but we think we understand them now. So we gave different infections to the mice, the Staphylococcus, different in the ear or in the peritoneum. And when we looked at neutrophil counts, the excellent neutrophils, they always were more numerous, so more neutrophils compared to their wild type uh, lithiumate controls in all these cases. So neutrophils seem to go faster into these inflammation sites when wasp is overactive. So to address this in a competitive setting, we injected wild type, sorry, wild type cells or the XLM mutant cells, uh, neutrophils, IV into a mouse, uh, and this was, yes, we were using congenic market to differentiate the different cells. We gave an air pouch, and here, this is basically a pocket of air. Into the air pouch, we inject TNF alpha and FMAP to attract the neutrophils from the blood into this empty pocket. So that allow us to really see from the naive state how many neutrophils get in here. And uh, what we found, uh, this was a lot of mice because we think this is important data. So if you just look here, if you look in the blood, so these are wild type, wild type, and the way to read this scale is anything above zero is advantage for the mutants, and anything below zero is a disadvantage. So wasp deficient neutrophils are known to migrate more poorly than the wild type neutrophils. But in the blood, we find sort of similar numbers of all cells, so no competitive advantage or disadvantage. But into the spleen and air pouch, the two XLM mutants had a quite marked, this is a twofold advantage, to migrate into these sites. So we really think that actually these overactive neutrophils, they migrate much faster into the tissues from the blood. And perhaps this is also what we saw in the saliva of the patients. We looked at phagocytosis. 
And again, the Ixalan mutants in red, they take up E. coli and Staphylococcus much faster than their wild type, um, the wild type elitimate neutrophils. And we looked at uh, intracellular ROS. Uh, so this is also something produced within the cell, so neutrophils can both produce reactive oxygen species to kill bacteria in the phagosomes or to release it. Uh, so wasp deficient neutrophils in blue had much lower reactive oxygen production. The two XLM mutants again seem to be overactive in this response, so they produce much less, uh, much more reactive oxygen species. Uh, so now we sort of had a big question mark: what is going on? So the migration in vitro that I didn't show you and in vivo is increased. They have increased phagocytosis and increased intracellular ROS. So then we wanted to have some final evidence for what is going on. So we tried to mimic the activated endothelium in a controlled way. So we coated glass slides with selectin, which would be this binding, ICAM that would promote the integrin binding, and the chemokine here, KCIL8. And then we saw what happened. Now what was interesting, perhaps, is that we think it's working. <coughs> so now there is a flow here in this direction. And you can see that the neutrophils are rolling here. They're actually rolling if you take uh, snapshots on the, the sort of activated surface. Some have arrested, so they have started to activate the integrant ligand, and then they spread out. And you can see that those that are spread out are actually still moving around. So we think this sort of mimics uh, the interaction with the endothelium. And what did we find? Uh, so what we really predicted from the beginning was that they have so much actin that they have very stiff these neutrophils, but it didn't seem to be the case. So when we looked at arrested cells, these are the white ones here. Uh, you can see the rolling tracks here also, actually. Uh, there was no difference between the two, XLM and the Y type. However, when we look at the spread cells, these ones that really have activated the integrin, there were much more um, XLM neutrophils that spread out compared to the Y type, and this is under sheer stress. So the blood flow is somewhere here, so we are really increasing it a lot, and these still <laughs> adhere to the surface. Uh, I think let me skip that in the interest of time. And they yes, say that uh, what we believe is going on is that uh, a normal neutrophils really needs to fine-tune the wasp activity to have a normal response. So too little, they become hyper-responsive. We and others have shown that. If it's too much, they actually become hyper-responsive. So they go faster into the tissues where they actually produce a lot of ROS and kill bacteria. Uh, so just to show, you know, are there any questions on that part? Let me continue. Just to show you what we are building now. Uh, so I showed you this before. This is a new research building where we are. We have five departments that move into this building. Um, and it's all very nice if we didn't need to pay the rent for it. So uh, we are happy and uh, a little bit less happy when we think about that. Uh, we are going to be here on the seventh floor. And this is actually when we were visiting the new building recently. And uh, I think this very well describes my lab. We are all slightly you know, looking at different directions and doing different things. Never really you know, uniform. There are only some people missing. Two were in the clinic. There were some that were away in other labs working and so forth. Uh, but we get together now and then, so don't worry. And these are more pictures uh, where we are walking around there, and it's really high up, and I'm really scared of heights. So this is me, really dreading for, you know, what's going on. This is Joanna, who's always super happy, you know, whatever happens with her in case um, And this is just a picture of Stockholm, since I saw you all there. All, all the building work that we are doing. Okay, so I just want to spend now the last uh, 10 minutes or so describing uh, MK1, which is another uh, product we're working on, also related to acting. 
Um, and the uh, MK1 is an acting sensor um, that finds or sort of senses the level of globular actin in the cytoplasm. When globular actin uh, is low in concentration, MK1 shuttle into the nucleus where it interacts with the serum response factor and activate uh, up to 150 different genes, including actin itself, also integrin molecules, coffelin, and so on. Um, so there was a study in 2015 from Adrian Thrasher's lab where they have identified a four-year girl that had a deficiency in MK1. Uh, and she had a loss of function uh, mutation on both copies of the gene. And she had recurrent bacterial infections and the really severe immunodeficiency. And they could withhold genome sequencing, identify point mutation in this huge gene. I will soon show you. They have a reduced polymerase acting in hematopathic cells. Uh, which you would expect from deficiency. Neutrophils had reduced migration and phagocytosis, and reduced migration really means that they were stuck. They didn't move at all. And uh, the dendritic cells had very aberrant formation of adhesion and protosomes. Now, Julian Record, who was the first author on this paper, joined my lab in 2016. And we then became interested in triplets, uh, of which two had developed Hodgkin lymphoma. One was treated already in 1986, and the other in 2008, and the third has not developed Hodgkin lymphoma. Now, Magnus Björkholm identified uh, using uh, um, CGH and looking for translocations and insertions uh, because of the Hodgkin lymphoma, that these triplets had an intronic deletion in MK1. And you see it's a huge gene with 15 coding exons. And we were interested to see what is the MK1 expression and activity, and what is the B cell functionality. And we were actually especially interested in the non-treated triplet, because that's where we thought we could find something. Uh, and I should say, our expectation was that MK1 would be deficient here because of the intronic deletion, but I'll show you what we found. And this is Julian, who uh, worked with the London MK1 deficient patient, and this is Anton, who is also uh, clinically active at the Karolinska University Hospital. Um, let me see. Right. So I just changed the color coding here. So uh, we may DBV transform B cells. We have also looked to some extent at primary lymphocytes from the patients. Uh, and you can see if you look at MK1, um, the patients, HL2, here compared to the control, have higher expression, also compared to this control. I should say, however, that MK1 is quite a messy protein to look for, so the only way to really see it is by Western blotting. Uh, so, if we look at the, the two controls, this is MK1. The Asian 0 is standing out with a lot more MK1 protein. Asian 1 and Asian 2 seem to be a little bit in between, and this is quantified here. But if anything, Asian 0 has about twice the amount of MK1 protein. And as I said, MK1 regulates a lot of target genes when it's active. So one way to study activity is to look for the target genes, say it's RAC1, Tallinn, Integrin, Actin, and SRF itself. And you can see that the red bar is really standing out. The other two seems to behave like a control. So the, the treatment that didn't develop Hodgkin have really high activity of MK1. And we look at the F-actin in the primary cells, and it is increased in all patients, actually, compared to the controls. And we also looked at G-actin, F-actin ratio, uh, and we found significant, although that not that impressive, increase in G-actin in the HL0 uh, triplet. Uh, so we then wanted to study cytoskeletal responses to see if this aberrant expression of MK1 would have any consequences. And this is an assay to study the functional actin cytoskeleton in B cells, where we put B cells on antibodies that makes them spread. And you can see here, 
this is green acting, they do spread out a little bit, the blue is the nucleus. And what we are really looking for is the cells that make these long dendrites, which is a sign of an actin, active, active, active cytoskeleton. So if we quantify these control cells, give around 30-40% of these long spread cells, the HL0 and HL1 patients had really increased cell spreading, even up to 70-80% here. And this correlated with an increased uh, adhesive area. And do this uh, act in an MK1 activity have any consequence for, for proliferation? Uh, since the two, you know, two of the siblings had the uh, triplets had developed Hodgkin lymphoma. So here we looked at primary B cells uh, from blood, looking at KI67 for cell proliferation. And you can see the two controls had very few proliferating cells, whereas the, all the triplet cells had a high number of KI67 positive cells. We then went back to our EBV cells, and we found that the HL0 had about two-fold increase in proliferation as measured by um, thymidine uh, DNA synthesis. And what we also noted when we look at the DNA content, since Hodgkin lymphoma is characterized by these uh, diploid um, cells that they have a two nuclei, the reed sternberg cells, we looked for the increased DNA content, so here you have GV0, G1, synthesis G2M. But in the HL0, there was this tail with cells that had more than 2M DNA content, and this is quantified here. So are these cells then these diploid um, uh, with Sternberg cells? Well, actually, we don't think so, because it seems that all, all the lines have different, uh, same amount of cells with more than one nuclei. So we carried on to do telomere fish, and this would identify any aberration in chromosome number, or chromosome translocation. So it's difficult to see here, but that is blue for the chromosome, and red are the telomeres. And when we looked for uh, aberrations of basically how many chromosomes would meta or would these cells have, this is a normal one with uh, 46 chromosomes in humans. This has about double amount of chromosomes. And you can see that it was quite a lot of them, up to 30% that had this uh, characteristic increase in chromosomes. So now we did some tumor biology experiments, maybe not the best immunology experiment, but we took the cells that are human cells and grafted them into mice to see if they formed tumors. Uh, so these are not skid gamma, so very immunocompromised mice. And we looked at day 10. And when we injected control cells, they didn't grow at all. And when we injected the, the cells from the triplet that have not yet developed Hodgkin they grow a lot, actually, and form large tumors. And we could also find blood vessels in the tumor, suggesting that they had angiogenesis. And another thing that we looked at, which is also dependent on the actin cytoskeleton, and, uh, and the ICAM uh, uh, LFA1 uh, responses is aggregation. So here you see EBV cells under two hours and how they start to form these very nice aggregates. I think you can see here they're quite dense. And when we looked at the HL0 cells, it looked quite different. So they didn't really form these nice tight aggregates. And this is something we also saw in tissue culture. So that led us to examine the expression of integrating molecules on these cells. So when we looked at ICAM, so B cells express both ICAM and LFA1, there was no difference in expression. However, when we looked at CD11A or LFA1, the HL0 uh, cells really stood out and had very low um, CD11A expression that probably led to this deficiency in cell aggregation. But if you also look at the pattern here, so these are CD11A histograms. The two controls have, you know, it's not sort of clear cut, but most of them are high in CD11A. The HL0 is really low in CD11A. 
ancient one and less ancient two had two populations of cells. So we started to think, could it be that, we should probably know that the variable response of these cells is due to that they have two populations of cells. So we actually sorted out uh, the CD11A low cells and high cells to see if one of them were more prone to sort of develop this, um, I wouldn't say Hodgkin lymphoma cell type, but in, you know, proliferative uh, cell type. So we sorted out the two populations now from one patient. And we looked at the aggregation response. I think I will not show this because of the time. Uh, so let me just show you here. So this is the, the area that I just showed you, the aggregates. And you can see that the CD11A high cells, which we thought would behave like controls, they made aggregates. The CD11A low cells, they had much less formation of these tight aggregates. And when we looked at MK1 protein, the CD11A high had MK1 and the CD11A low had much more of the MK1 protein, and this is quantified here. And finally, when we injected these two cells, only the CD11A low actually gave rise to, to tumors. So we do believe that it suggests that Asian one patient cells are composed of two subpopulations. The CD11A low is the sort of HL0 Hodgkin cells, and the CD11A high are the control cells. And if you remember now, HL1 was the patient that was treated in 1986, which is uh, quite a long time ago. So what we suggest is that the CD11A low cells is a characteristic of sort of the pre-lymphoma cells and that they are coming back after treatment. And so what I just showed you is uh, MK1. And what we find in this patient is that at least the, the patients that haven't developed, um, the triplet that haven't developed Hodgkin lymphoma have increased MK1 protein, activity, much more acting, and this leads to genomic instability and development of Hodgkin lymphoma, potentially, we cannot say that. Uh, so I raised this conundrum in immunology in the beginning, and you know, what we have done, I didn't show you all the work, but during the last um, what is it, eight, eight, nine years since I started my group, we have tried to reuse different mutants where we both study loss of function and gain of function. And what we really see is that the immune cells have a skewed immune response. So some cells are overactive, as also you have shown. Some are hyper-responsive, they don't respond. And this really highlights that fine-tuning of the, uh, the activity of acting regulators is really a key feature of our immune system. And with that, I would just like to thank, so Martin has done basically all the neutrophil work with a lot of help from Joanna and me. Julian and Anton led the MK1 project, where also Nick has done a lot of the really time. Joanna has done the in vivo tumors. Um, I didn't talk so much, Mariana works with dendritic cells mean B cells and Hanna B cells and so forth. And uh, this is just the collaborators and the funding. So thank you so much.